Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm so glad that you've joined us today. I'm here today with Sawyer Stream Hobbs, who is an amazing guy and has an amazing story to tell us. And Sawyer, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for being brave and courageous enough to come out and, and tell your story. I think it's really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to thank everybody that was a part of this because I understand like it's you and I sitting up here, but there's so much more that goes on behind everything that we've done here and like the preparation. I just wanted to say thank you and show gratitude for that. That's cool. Yes, very much so. I love you all too. <laughs> all right. So first off, I'm going to talk about the men's walk that happened yesterday here in Honolulu. Started at the Capitol. And I think we have some pictures of it. There were a thousand people there, a thousand fifty actually, that came and did this walk. It was a men's walk trying to get men involved in the prevention stages of domestic violence. And until we get men involved in the prevention stages, we're not going to make the kind of sustainable change that needs to be made. Women can stand and bang their fists forever. And until we get men involved, too, we are not really going to make the kind of changes that we need. There were a lot of policemen that showed up. Mayor Caldwell was there. Um, I got to talk to him for a little while. And there was all kinds of mucky mucks that came. and. Um, you know, uh, showed their support for this so important issue. The police were there in force, and I think the whole force was there. I'm not sure. But I think every policeman that was not out driving a car on their beat was there to support women and, and just be there to show that they don't want any more domestic violence to happen either. That was a really powerful thing. And then we got all kinds, I think I've got some pictures of the guys walking, we get to see. Um, oh yeah, the Department of Justice was there. Uh, victims' rights, they were there to support. Um, there was a huge contingent from UH that was there. This was really neat that we had a, a guy that was there to uh, give some chants and, and bring the, the authentic Hawaiian uh, element to the whole proceedings. There was all kinds of signs that were all along the way. Literally a hundred and, I mean, a thousand fifty people were out there walking. And then there was a big rally afterwards at, um, at Iolani Palace. Oh, there's another shot of them walking. It was really great. There was a lot of them. Like I said, a thousand fifty people were there. And then there was a big rally. This whole thing was really organized by Domestic Violence Action Center, um, which is DVAC. There you go, and there's a picture of some of them right there. Uh, Nancy Kriegman is the, the founder of DVAC, and they do so much amazing work. And I know that they were a big driving force behind this whole entire day. It was really special to be there. It was special to be part of it. Um, DVAC wasn't the only people out there with a the table. We had Catholic Charities was there. We had um, the people from Children and Families. Uh, they were there. Um, these hands are for helping, not for hurting. I love their, um, I love the thing that they, their little slogan that they have. And so it was really nice to be there with all of these people that worked so hard to be part of the proceedings for the day. So if you, uh, if you hear about this on the news, if you have a chance to support it in any way, even though it's over now, this is October. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And that's why I'm wearing this purple ribbon. And I want everyone to please come out and support victims of domestic violence. If you are a man that is not out there abusing, I want you to start standing up to the men that do abuse. Because like I said, until we get you guys involved, we're not going to get the kind of sustainable change that we need. You see, you can see the, 
program, I brought the program with me back and some of the, the things that they handed out while we were there. It was a really big day. Um, only took a short time, but it makes such a difference. Okay, but enough of this. I want to start talking to the guests that I've got here today because Sawyer has a really important story to tell. And I thank you for waiting while I went through all that <laughs> men's march stuff because I want to get to your story. It's, a, it's an important story for people out there to hear. So just how about if you tell me again exactly what happened to you when you were a young man. Um, okay, so at the age of three and a half, I was molested by my uncle. Um, but and at the time, my uncle was 15 years old. The, this whole occurrence took place within his bedroom, which was the closest room to the living room within my grandparents' house at the time. And everyone, the entirety of my family, or at least my immediate family, including my, my aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, my immediate siblings, which I have four of, um, and then my parents were all there. Oh my gosh, so, the whole family was in the living room, mm -hmm. and this happened in the bedroom. What did he do? Um, so my recollection of that day, obviously because I was three and a half, was... Right. <laughs> Right. Didn't mean to put you on the spot and get so specific, excuse me. <laughs> I was sitting in his room and in it was basically like just a square. And in the back left corner, the door is in the front left corner. There's the TV and we were watching The Simpsons. I was sitting on a chair and he was sitting on his bed. And his bed was in the back right corner. And I just remember him stand, watching The Simpsons and then I shifted frames and turned to him pulling his pants down. Um, and he made me suck on his penis um, wow. and I don't but like none of that is like recollectable like right. it, it can be primed by thinking about the situation mm -hmm. but all I remember is him pulling his pants down but wow. I don't like it goes like somewhat like black and like like hazy to a certain extent um, and then I whenever that ended which I, I have no reference of time I walk out and there's like a long hallway, which seemed like an extremely long hallway at the time because I was so small. Like everything seemed so big with all the shadows and stuff. Right. I sure. walk out and I, I say to my family, I say, I sucked Brian's dick. Wow. And my grandma is on the far corner of the living room. And she's like, what did you say, Sawyer? And I said, I sucked Brian's dick. And for my grandma, that's when her memory goes black. But all she remembers was my dad stood up. She immediately called the police. Brian walked out of his room after me. So it's a little three and a half year old me. And then I say it, my grand, my father hears it, stands up. My uncle comes out of the room. My grandma calls the police, everything goes black. Wow. Um, so after that, I really have no idea what kind of happened in that situation. Um, I don't remember, remember the police showing up. I don't remember anything my dad said or did. Um, I don't remember any sort of aggression. I don't remember any sort of friendliness. Like it's just blank. Wow. Um, and that was really interesting, uh, looking back on it now. It's so weird because you have, the, you have the two sides of it. You have the side of it from my grandparents where, like, this was their son. Um, and to have to come to terms with the fact that this is something that your son was capable of, that he, right. that he would actually carry out. And then on, on someone else that was in your family, though, um, right. So kind but of putting love yourself, just as much. Exactly. Right. So what are you supposed to do there? And there's yeah. that idea of sides comes in, but it's like it's really not sides. It's not a binary sides. It's a oneness of we are together. Um, right. But it was looked at like sides were picked. Like obviously my grandparents like full willingly supported like my my uncle and like tried to do everything they could to care for him in this time. And then my family had a different way of going about it, where my uncle immediately became my father's arch enemy um, and is still to this day his arch enemy. Wow. Um, and then my mom kind of being stuck in the middle, where it's like, okay, my dad gets extremely angry about it, doesn't like to talk about it um, or like mention anything that had happened. Right. And then my mom, who like this, this is her brother too, but she, like she has a husband and then a family and then a son that this had just happened to. Sure. Um, so. At that point, like a, a lot of a lot of court uh, <laughs> callings were were brought together, and I was never I never had to stand trial. I never had to like sit in front of a judge. Really, you speak. never had to go and be on the stand, or even go and into the judge's chambers and mm -mm. tell your story or anything. It just went by 
what all the parents had said and your grandparents and everybody said? Yeah, so actually this is, um, I, I had sat outside of the courtroom several times apparently, which I, I also don't remember, which was something that was told to me all of a few years ago within the past year actually. Um, so I don't even remember ever being at the courthouse to have to deal with any of this. Uh -huh. um, several people within the court case read accounts of things that happened with me afterwards. Um, they, they read things of my reaction. For instance, my father had once read a note that told about how at night I would scream and cry out my dad's name in fear of the fact that my uncle was coming to get me. Oh, wow. Um, which, to my knowledge, is a lie. Um, really? Yes. So did your mom Did your mom say that that was a lie or something? How did you know it was a lie? No, so the, fa my per my, the family dynamic really changed after that. Sure, um, it'll, yeah, it'll do that. I know that one, actually, because I'm the one who's broke the silence in my family. And it just split us apart. It split everyone apart. We didn't even speak. I didn't even speak to my mother for six years afterwards. And it's like, where were you? Why didn't you protect me kind of thing? But when I broke the silence and told everybody, it just exploded the family completely. So that's the thing. My dad was the cause of that silence mm -hmm. um, because it angered him so much that he didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to bring it to light. And he kind of... Vic, it, it seemed like he became more of the victim than I was the victim. Um, even though I don't, yeah, he kind of he kind of brought it upon himself, and actually ended up coming out with a story about his childhood at that point. So this, obviously, there's so many different things um, uh -huh. that could have come together in order for him to have to come forward, and like maybe like this was the moment that he needed to get so much courage, so he had. He had to take advantage of this moment that he, like, felt the power and like was able to overcome the shame of like, okay, this had happened to me when I was younger. Whereas it could be looked at from the perspective of he is simply trying to take the limelight. But what if it was that he had avoided this this whole idea of his abuse within his life, and this was right. the only way that he this was the only way that he could find an outlet. Um, right, because he was angry about his own, and now he's got a son that he can be angry for. Exactly. Also. But nothing was ever communicated. That was the biggest thing. My mom mm. never communicated to my father. My father never communicated to my mom, and nobody ever communicated to me. Which So it should have been this triangulated like conversation um, within all of us. But it was kind of everybody was in their own frame. Everybody had their own little portion of the story that they carried with them. But there was it was impossible to bring together all of the chapters because they were held so singularly. Right. It's amazing how it can affect each person so differently. I know um, my sister is so different from her reaction to it all and, and my reaction and my brother too. And so it's like each one of us has our own perception of what it is. And, and when it's happened a long time ago, it's hard because just because of the way the memory works, you know, kind of like we've been seeing with all these um, things that are on the news right now with Judge Kavanaugh and Dr. Ford, who came forward against him and has, she has memories of the incident itself, but not some of the extraneous memories that go around it. Mm -hmm. His memory is such a difficult thing to really um, define and pin down, right? Everything that happens in the, hy in the hippocampus, or hippocampus, excuse me, um, is so, it's so hard to predict and define. But, okay, well, whew, after all this, we have so much more to talk about. So I'm hoping that everyone will stay with us. We're going to take just a little bit of a break here. I'm Cynthia Sinclair, and this is Finding Respect in the Chaos. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. え、各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミュニティ、ハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報、ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちは、ハワイ。各週の月曜日2時からぜひ
Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and I'm here with Sawyer Stream Hobbs, who is an amazing young man and has just a remarkable outlook on how he's brought his life full circle and how um, all of the things that happened to him when he was younger have shaped his life and sort of shaped his family's structure at the same time. So I'm really just so grateful that you're here. And I really applaud your courage for being able to come out and, and talk about these things. And I know you've like told people your whole life too, um, going back like to seventh grade even coming out. And I think that's just really bold. And it's really remarkable because that is not the norm. It's like most people just don't ever want to say anything because um, of shame. And there's such an important thing that happens for men as opposed that's I should say not not that it's unique to men because women feel the shame too but men seem to feel it on a different level um, it's so much more intense because it makes them question their manhood um, makes them question their masculinity all those things and then society puts this extra light on you guys about how you know it affects men differently and how you need to be more shamed and and I'm I'm just I'm really struck by how amazing it is that you don't feel that, that you have risen above it and, and have integrated it into who you are. And I really think that's a remarkable thing. And so I, I'm really happy that you're here to share all that with us. I think it's really cool. I think it's interesting that you you brought up the idea a little bit on like men versus women and how like this situation is handled, whether they are the people that this occurrence happened to or they're people that are hearing of it from someone else. So I attribute a lot of the way that I handled and like communicated about it to the fact that I have five girls in my immediate family. I have two older sisters, two younger sisters, and then my mother. Wow. Um, so I've always been extremely comfortable with women. And a lot of like my best friends growing up that like I would like find some sort of like nurturing and <laughs> would be women and like good people to talk to if I ever had some sort of feelings or emotions or something that I like right. I had to get out. So I saw it as something where I was extremely willing to tell women about that experience that I had um, and talk to them about like how it made me feel. But and it was really strange how this kind of idea of sexual abuse comes out in the most nuanced ways in just random conversations right. um, because it is something that is just like kind of a part of the world around us that we don't see that is kind of tried to be made this underground you shouldn't talk about this right. so it would just come up randomly and I would just talk about it as if it was the weather with these people and it would seem as if nothing was wrong about it because wow. to me nothing was right um, I, I had no ability to talk about it in my home because my father never wanted to talk about it and my mother right. res tried to respect the fact that my dad never wanted to talk about it so therefore it was never brought up in a conversation. So I, saw, I took it upon myself where it's like, okay, like this is something we can talk about. Um, <laughs> I was like, I can just like toss this around. Um, but I never, I always kept it with my family like, no, no, I don't tell people because they, I felt like they took it on as a part of their identity. Uh, um, right. So I used it as like, this is my identity, like I'm gonna use it, but I'm not gonna tell anybody that this is a part of me. Um, but I can see how, because it also affected my family, which right. is really interesting. Um, it completely tore my family apart for, sure. the, for the years after um, in ways that I never realized, that I never saw. So I never, I couldn't go into my grandparents' house. Um, oh. I had her for the Did first- Because your, your uncle lived there? My is uncle that why? lived there, yes. Oh, okay. Um, I could never go in there unless it was for certain that he wasn't there, which like obviously took a lot more work and effort and like the sure. planning preparations of going to visit my grandparents that live five minutes away from me. Um, oh, wow. And I, for the first few years, we had a restraining order against my uncle and 
family functions were never complete family functions. Everybody saw you in fractals, where like I saw like the, this aunt and uncle, and then this aunt and uncle. Christmas was by ourselves at the beginning, and then my grandparents would come for two hours, and then I would go see my aunt, my other aunt and uncle, and then like Thanksgivings were done with like a separate part of my mom's family that wasn't even connected to this part of the family. So it's like we became this isolated orb that had to like float around from place to place to place talking and seeing mm -hmm. these people, which made it much more difficult. Whereas why not just gather together? Why can't I do that? But I never saw it as like, I always went on family vacations, went to family dinners with just my immediate family, just those seven people. So that became my sphere of what the idea of family was. Uh -huh. So it made me define it much differently than kind of that holistic form, which was like, which is like really organic and just natural. And I right. can go talk to any of these people. But then like high school came around and I started being, being able to see the gravity of what had happened instead of just using it as like this pawn piece to like, okay, like I'm gonna tell this girl about it or I'm gonna tell my best friends about it or like whoever I'm going to tell. It's like, okay, so like I have acknowledged it outside the sphere of my family and communicating. Why don't we start acknowledging it in this sphere? So I talked to my mom about it. I remember it was like junior year of high school. I was like, like I've been thinking about Brian lately. She's like, and I have another uncle named Brian, which is interesting. Um, so I have two. And so she's like, okay, well, like, like, what do you mean? I was like, well, like, I haven't been able to talk to this man, and I don't even know who he is. He's just a concept to me. Right. Like, it's like this, like, image. It's like a poster that you put on the wall, but there's, like, something on the back side of it that leads to, like, a portal into, like, who a person actually is. Um, so I started, I started, I brought it up, and then... It got from my mom to my grandparents, my, and then my grandparents wanted to talk about it. So I arranged a meeting with my grandparents to talk about it at their house. Sat there for like five hours, six hours, just kind of talking. Uh -huh. We were just like shooting anything, like kind of just like talking the way you will. Like I, I could talk to my grandparents for days, but that was a main importance was like seeing how I felt because nobody ever knew how I felt. That was the thing. Because you weren't allowed to speak. Yeah, not right? necessarily. Well, it not wasn't exactly even... allowed, right? Yeah. But, but you didn't because of all of the silence that had been put on there for your dad. Yeah. So people, I started following like the general flow and curve of I'm just going to go with like the status quo here, um, right. which is not even necessarily that somebody told it to me. It was an energy that I felt sure. that like was hard to break out of. Right. But like now that this opportunity came to be, I was taking advantage of it. Sure. I was telling people how I felt. So what? How was? What was their reaction when you told them? Listen, I, I want to talk about this now. That's when the lies just started unraveling. Oh, yeah. Just like out of their mouths, out of everybody's mouths, out of all of these different stories that they had gathered, but nobody ever talked to me about because it's you don't talk to Sawyer about it because he's like psychologically has some sort of like an induced pain every single time you oh, try to mention this. Right. Um, when it wasn't even true. It was their own perception forced yeah. onto you. Exactly. Ah. But it wasn't even necessarily their own. It was just circulated because nobody, like I said, nobody communicated. It was right. nobody's fault. It's just that nobody told anybody. Everybody was scared of one another. Well, it's the silence. And silence is the thing about, in my mind anyway, that's the thing that hurts people and more than anything is the silence. And it's deafening. It's very loud, the silence is, you know, and you hear it even though it's silence, <laughs> right? And I know that sounds kind of backwards, but, but it's really true. You, you do, you kind of hear it even though it's silence. I was born feet first. I've been backwards ever since. Um, <laughs> so, bas so basically what happened then is three days later, I was in the same room as my uncle. Um, uh -huh. We were at a neutral location at my great-grandma's house, which is about a hop, a skip, and a jump one street over from my grandparents' house. Um, so it was a place where we could both feel comfortable. We could both go. Walked in, he's sitting down in, in the chair, gets up, gives me a handshake. My grandma's sitting there, give her a hug, sit down, and Brian and I talk. Um, wow. Just him and I. And it was really, it was really incredible. Um, we didn't, we, obviously a lot had happened, and a lot to acknowledge, but we didn't see the point and the purpose of reminiscing over something that had happened that was a part of a past life. We wanted to see the repercussions and consequences that came to be after the fact. Right. So Brian told me his story for the very first time that I'd never heard. He told me about everything that he had to do. In he, was, he was in high school still. Uh, he just wanted, he wanted to play football. So he was on probation and actually on house arrest. So his, my grandparents had to lie every single time the probation officer came and say that he had some sort of after school activity that he had to stay back and take a test or this, that, or the other. Just so, so he, he could, could play, play football? football. 
Wow. And it became so excruciating for him in such a process that he had to stop playing football. Sure. He, and, and his counselor, his counselor started telling him about how he could never have any sort of physical contact or emotional relationship with a girl because he would ruin her. Oh. So up until this point in his life, he still has not. Um, which is really, so it shows that, yes, Brian had done something at this time in his life. But also a lot had to happen after the fact, which were consequences for him. But why should we both be living with this consequence now that's now actually become a, con a consequence for our entire family? Right. Um, wow. We never got together as a whole. So at the end of that conversation, Brian and I gave each other a hug. We took a picture together, and I walked to my best friend's house. Brian offered me a ride, and I was just like, no, like, I'd just rather walk. Like I just like walking. But it became normal. A few months after that, we had our very first ever family Christmas where we all came together. Wow. Um, the very first time that I ever can like remember that I had that. Wow. Everybody that so I loved great. was in the same room. <laughs> that's amazing. I love the idea of reconciliation after the fact. Um, I know for me, when my family finally came together, it was just this huge feeling that I still, every time I remember, I want more of, you know? Because it split my brother and sister and I apart, but just recently they came in May for my graduation, and it was like, we just played together and had fun. We didn't have to deal with the hard stuff. We could just be people now. And I think that's what you're talking about. It's like your family could just be people now, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of so um, destroyed by the events, mm -hmm. where it sounds like your uncle's life was kind of destroyed by the event. Mm -hmm. Well, in a way, rightfully so, because you can't do those kinds of things without having a consequence that happens. Mm -hmm. Because if, if there had been no consequence, it's possible that he could have gone on to be somebody who molests children. Mm -hmm. It's very possible, but because, because of what happened and the intervention that happened, it might have stopped him from going on any further. Wow. I think it's remarkable that you have come full circle, that you were able to, to have such a great outlook on all of this. We've only got another minute, so is there a last thing you'd like to say, maybe even to the people that are, that are listening here today? Um, Over this summer, I lived with my uncle. I was the door next to my uncle's at my grandparents' house. Um, in, that, that is a total role reversal from never being able to go to my grandparents' house to living in my grandparents' house next to the man that I was taught to fear my whole life. And the important part to remember about that, though, is that that didn't just happen. We can talk about this in 28 minutes, all of the things that had happened in a very consolidated manner, but this took 15 full years of cycling over the same circle and finding a way to get out of it. It was breaking that cycle of lies, miscommunication, just like fear, sorrow. It's, there's so many things that go in, into it. But the one thing that was able to bring us all back together was that one moment when communication was key, when the opportunity presented itself. But the thing was, sometimes that opportunity isn't this golden sphere that is handed to you. It is something that you have to create and generate for yourself. And you have those people around you in any way, shape, and form. You have it in the people that are walking past you on the street that all you need to do is stop and say, help. All you need to stop do is stop and say, I need this. Because there's nothing wrong with saying, I need help or I need something because we can't all do it on our own. It is the most strong thing ever to have the will to overcome the silence in your own mouth, that cat that it literally has your tongue and holds you into that life that is crippling you. So basically, all it takes is one conversation and everything can be made new again. Oh my, um, wow. Now, now you know why I introduce him as a remarkable man. <laughs> wow, thank you so much for coming, Sawyer. Thank you so much for being so amazing and, and so articulate and so brave and, and courageous to come out and tell your story like this because I believe it'll make a difference for other men that are, that are locked in that silence. Who's, who's still got that cat with a hold of their tongue, right? Wow. Well, 
everyone, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today here on Finding Respect in the Chaos. We're out of time. I wish we weren't, but we are. So I hope you'll come back and join us again here on Think Tech Hawaii. Um, I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and I want to thank you for coming.